Hello, I am Amanda Kasser and welcome back to Season 3 of Financial Secrets Revealed. Today I am joined by the lovely Beata Chalette, who is the growth architect, founder of the Women's Code, and provides visionaries and leaders with proven strategies, blueprints and growth maps that provide clear steps to improve business systems. That's a mouthful, Beata. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Amanda. You know how it is. You know, it's like it's like like a tweet. Uh, I guess it's not a tweet anymore. I don't anymore. know if I've got 140 characters there. <laughs> you, you, you have to you have to keep in the shortest amount of time with the biggest words you can possibly find. <laughs> so tell me what that actually means in layman's terms. What have you done? Yes. How did you get there? Yeah. So it's very simple. So people come to me for one out of two reasons. So they either want to grow their business and they're now at a point where they bought enough, spent enough time, wasted enough money, uh, and they say, I, I think I need a strategy and some systems in place to actually grow my business. Or they have grown their business and now they are at this burnout formula, typically about a million dollars plus, where they go, I'm doing everything by myself. I can't find the right people. I can't keep working like this. My partner hates me. My kids don't want to speak to me. I need to figure out how to scale this really quickly. And I also need systems and strategies and workflows and processes so I can scale this. And then I come in and the idea is very simple. We identify what the goal is, where do we want to go? The goal determines what the strategy is going to be because if I know where they want to go and where they are today, I can reverse engineer the strategy. And then we build the systems that are actually going to accomplish the goal of the strategy to the goal. That's it. And does this work across every type of business or is there particular types of business you focus on? Um, it works for pretty much all businesses. I find that many of my clients are in service businesses on whether it's, it's digital marketing, branding agencies, uh, coaches, consultants, experts, people that do a lot of services. I've had clients um, that are in the, uh, I had a, a client that, that does blazers, empowerment blazers for women that have secret messages stitched in so that when you go to the boardroom and you open your jacket in the bathroom, it says powerful. <laughs> and then you're pumped up Very when cute. you go into a meeting, you know, like, which of course I love. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, you know, I've worked with people in fitness and wellness and massage uh, photographers. So um, all across the board, it's, you know, everybody really needs a strategy and some systems to get where they want to go. So if people are working in corporate, they're not enjoying it as much as they thought they were, they're on the mill, they're doing well, they've got this idea or they've mm -hmm. got a side hustle for their idea, is it a great idea to get in early with the strategy side or build it up until you think you need a strategy? Can you do what, what's best do you think? I love that because it's the sneakiest questions I've, I've heard in a long time. So and here's why this is sneaky. Because most people, when they first go out with an idea, they go in the internet world and then they listen to the, they go like, where, where, where's the money? So they go to the big internet marketers and then the big internet marketers are big internet marketers because they're very good at marketing and they're very good at selling what they market because that's their whole business. Like, you know, blanket the market with messages so that you feel that you're missing out if you don't buy their stuff. You have no strategy. You don't know what you want to do. But you go that that sounds really compelling. I need to buy that without any plan. Now, then you bought this. Let's say it's a thing about speaking from stage. Now, inevitably, there's an affiliate that comes in right after you had bought this. And it says, did you ever thought, think about that? When you speak from stage, you also need to be making an offer. Now you go, well, that sounds logical. Um, that, so that must be the next thing. So you buy that. Then the next guy comes and says, well, now that you have the offer, have you ever thought about that you actually need to do a product launch? You need to bring this product to market. Now you go, well, that sounds really good. Now I need to buy that. Then the next marketer comes and says, yeah, but where are you going to get the leads from? And you say, oh, of course I need leads. Now you buy the program for the leads. Now the next guy comes as without a funnel. This is useless. So now you bought, what, $100,000 worth of stuff and you have no idea how to put it and where to put it because you relied on a marketing and sales strategy to tell you what your business is going to be that doesn't work. So to answer your question, please don't do that. Save your, <laughs> save, Love it. Save, 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 save your money. And we, we, we're talking about money. We're talking about finance here, about smart decisions and finances. Unless you know where you want to go, none of this is going to work because you don't know if it is beneficial for you to get there. So if I tell you I'm going to pick you up, let's say, Amanda, I'm going to call you. 
I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to Australia and I'm going to say, I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you on a trip. And then the first thing you're going to say is, where are we going? Where are we going? And why would you ask me such a thing? <laughs> because I like to know. I can prepare. I can work you, out a plan to get there or cuz I'm local I might know a better way. <laughs> you, you 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 want to know if you need flip-flops or hiking boots. A jacket or yeah, a singlet. Exactly. So it's very much like that. So if we are going on a trip to building your business and to your own financial freedom by creating your own own business, it would be very very helpful for you to at least have a an idea on whether it's in Hawaii or on the North Pole. And that then determines a lot of these other things, because then if I, if I know the vicinity of where it is, then we can design the business model. And the business model matters. I, you know, the example that I give for that, Amanda, is now imagine you, you say, well, speaking sounds really great. This you know, great way to get in front of people, get my message out, get instant feedback. Great. Well, if you say that, in Australia, which is a very large country. Now you get speaking gigs on the other side of the country. To fly there and to give in one hour talk and fly back is at least two to three days because of the time difference, the duration of the flight. So now you're a successful speaker, you do a hundred days a year. Well, do the math. Now you're gone 300 days a year. Your partner will divorce you, your kids won't speak to you. So you need to be very careful about the kind of business model that you design for yourself. It needs to be congruent with what you want and the lifestyle you want to live. And then we can build it. And then I can tell you, speaking from stage, product launches, funnels, lead generation, where all these pieces come in, but not until you figure that out. So I'm going to be nosy here, Beata, and say, what are your chops in this? What's your experience? Have, have you been down the rabbit hole and been in debt yourself? Have you successfully sold businesses? What's your story that we should listen to you? Exactly. It's like, what's your story? So, <laughs> <Tell me about. laughs> so, so, so my story is that I really didn't know any better. And I, you know, I was laid off in a recession with a, with a, with a six months old uh, as my Marriage was absolutely failing. Found myself with a one-year-old, divorced, unemployed, and had to figure out how in the world am I going to learn how to run a business. And I made myself through a decade of bad luck, fires, floods, riots, earthquakes, September 11th, the tsunami, I mean, you name it, the, the hits just kept coming. And I ended up, after all of this, twice about $130,000, $135,000 in debt. The first time was because I sued my employee you got too close to my key vendor both of them proceeded to set up a business which was my business without me and then as i thought i was going to get out of this drama because it's very expensive to run a lawsuit i had a half a million of production volume on the book i was producing still photography shoots for wrangler levi mercedes-benz bmw great clients september 11th comes and one day everything was gone i mean literally in 24 hours i got more phone calls and we canceling 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 can't say nobody in their own right mind would go in a plane and fly to the United States. And so I, I, and then the lawsuit settled. I walked away with my debt canceled out, but I literally had zero. So I had to come up with another business, which was a stock photography business. And now I'm running up a style, a spiral staircase and four inch stilettos as fast as I can with a great idea, but no money. So I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into debt again. And I, I don't think I'm going to make it because now I'm borrowing money to pay interest on borrowed money. I call this the death spiral of I finance. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because there's, there's no recovery from it because you're already completely out of cash. And so what happened is then I had to go to Germany and drum up some business with you know, during a conference. And as I do that, my father has a stroke, but my father didn't have a stroke. My father had pancreatic cancer. Oh, wow. So now my dad dies six weeks later. Now I'm paying for a funeral on money I don't have. And I'm standing there and we literally just buried my dad. My phone rings. It's my office in Los Angeles. And they tell me that we've been served a notice and I'm losing the house. And I'm standing there, I'm falling to my knees, Amanda, I'm raising my fists and I yelled at God and I said, you know, dude, not to be it. disrespectful here, but <laughs> but 
if you have a plan, this would be a really good time to film me in because this doesn't, <laughs> this just doesn't make any sense. I can't sense. see. Yeah. I, I can't, yeah, I can't, no. I can't see this. And I, and then I surrendered and I got back. And not too long after that, I got a letter from the White House, the White House in the United States of America. Because in my desperation, I wrote a letter to the President of the United States. And I did that because my former mother in law, Amanda, was a big nag. You need to write the president of the United States. He's your president after all. You know, if, if anybody can help you as a president. Why did you need an... to write a letter to the president? What was that about? Well, I, uh, I didn't really even know what she wanted from me. Uh, so I just wrote the letter just so I wouldn't have to listen to this anymore. So all I could say is I wrote the letter. Okay, fine. And I wrote in the letter that um, the president always said that the small business was the backbone of the American economy. And I said, but that's not true. Because we've been hit so hard by by this. And I said, you know, I lost so much money. You know, I lost my business in, in September 11. So the letter that I got back from the White House basically said, we are uh, putting you in touch with a small business administration. And by the way, the president sends his best wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I hope uh, your mother-in-law was happy that you got the letter, though. <laughs> oh, my God. But, you know, please, please, please tell them thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, likewise, right? <laughs> back at you. Back, right back at you. <laughs> and so I walked into the Small Business Administration with a business plan and my finances in place and my financial projections. And then they helped me to restructure that in such a way that a bank would understand. Because at that point, it was $135,000 in debt. I mean, this was a question of weeks, maybe a month or two before it was game over. But, you know, I stuck with it. I'm like, who knows? Maybe, maybe I'll make it. And they freed up my line of credit by restructuring $135,000 in a 10-year fixed loan. That freed up my line of credit, forty-five thousand, that I then could use to, you know, do what I needed to do. Three months later, I'm break even. This is how close it was between bankruptcy and break even. Three months. Eighteen months later, I'm the world leader in my category. And that's how the Bill Gates company that eventually bought me came knocking on the door and says, Beata, can you tell us how you do it? And I said, Absolutely not. Like any decent woman, you want it, you buy it. <laughs> Put a ring on it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you want it, you put a ring on it. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> and they said, fine. How big of a ring does it need to be? I said, millions. And they said, fine. Wow. And that's how I got to sell my business for millions of dollars to Bill Gates himself, not Microsoft, but himself, 18 months after the worst moment of my life. So you talked about you had so many knocks along the way. I mean, there were the global ones that most people had to deal with, the September 11s, the, the crises, the tsunamis, the what's been going on even still with, you know, bushfires and economic issues. And then you've got personal issues as well on top of that. And, I mean, like you said, you're sitting down, you're on your knees, you're pleading with God, like, what is going on in my life right now? Most people who, who get to that spot, you know, we've, we've got a choice. We're at rock bottom, rock foundation, whatever you want to call it. Is it the bottom or is it the foundation that you then build? How do you find that resilience? Is it something you've had to work on or do you make a choice in that moment? How do you then go, right, <laughs> I think I've taken all the hits I can take. <laughs> Maybe not. But where do how do I crawl myself out of this pit? Because I still have ideas. I still have value. I still want to make a contribution. Like, is there nowhere else to go? So you've got to suck it up? What? How do you take that next step? I think it was really a combination out of everything. So number one, at that point, I'm so vested. And in speaking in the terms of mindset, I burned the bridges. I burned the boat. There was no boat to take me back to some other island. That I was on that island. That was it. I mean, I was either going to go down or not. There were two things that I thought about. So number one was I will not drown in a puddle. It's just not worth it. You drown, make sure it's an ocean. At least it's worth it. But puddle, no. The second thing was that I couldn't fathom Amanda that at the end of the day, that all of this was for nothing. I mean, that literally, I, I remember myself standing there and going like, I cannot believe that at the end of this, the joke will be on me. I mean, that was a thought that 
would literally make my head spin. I said, it's just not possible because I don't believe there's a cruel spirit, universe, God, whatever you want to call it. I don't believe that all of this is to to teach me a lesson of some sort that I need to shut up and sit down. I mean, that just couldn't, I couldn't compute that. So, so I literally stood, sat there and I said, there must be something in here that I am not seeing an opportunity that is that, that that everything stops before because I need to see this opportunity in front of me. And the opportunity was crazy as it is to write a letter to the president of the United States. Now, of course, I could have called the SBA myself. You know, it's a government <laughs> institution. It's open for everybody. Didn't think so you about do have that. one thing to thank your mother-in-law for. There you go. <laughs> uh, tr- absolutely, absolutely, truly. And I'm going, oh, uh, seriously, you know, but... But you have to, when when you're looking for these opportunities or these moments, opportunities always show up as challenges in disguise. That is what I have learned. So when something stops or slows down, and for a lot of people, a lot of stuff is slowing down right now because of the, 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 the recession. I mean, we've been talking about that we're in a recession for two years. We're really technically not even in a recession but people talking about it. And so we are, we are jointly manifesting this recession ourselves. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, 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 it's amazing how powerful this, this is. However, you get to choose on whether or not you want to participate in this or not. And when people then say, well, what do you do? Well, here's this very simple. We're talking about money here. We're talking about opportunity. We're talking about passive income. We're talking about financial stability, if all of your competitors are fearful and stop, what do you think you should do? <laughs> the exact opposite. Well, that is so logical the way you just said that. And then why is it so difficult for people to say, well, all of my competitors are laying off people. All of my competitors are preserving their 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 cash. All of my competitors are going into a protective mode. Now, for All of your listeners, I want you to envision when you go in protective mode, what's the hand gesture for protection? The energy goes down. It gets confined. It goes down. You put your arms around your child. You hold it close. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a hold close. There's no room. Back to the fatal position. Yep. Exactly. That's not growth. If we talk about growth, we open our hands and we go up. That's the inner. Now you can receive energy and you can transform energy. So that's what you need to be very careful about right now as you're creating opportunities. So you can either say, well, you know, just read it in the paper. Must be true. It must be true. <laughs> it was in the internet. <laughs> yeah, I saw so, it on the internet. It must be true. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think when the, when these opportunities come, our belief system, what we've been brought up with, these stories we've either seen or told ourselves or our parents have shared, do you think that makes a difference to the choices we make or can we overcome those ingrained, you know, it, it feels sometimes like it's part of our DNA to, to go into protection mode, to, to be sensible, to be smart, to, to bunker down when you're saying, no, 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 this is the time to fly and you're going, I can't do it. So do you think all those stories play a part? They, they, they are everything. I mean, when we look at psychology or when we look at mindset, we now know that the subconscious opinion has been formed by the time a child is seven. When we look at what that means, we wonder why there's racist, misogynistic jerks and all this negativity in the world. Well, that's because what the parents believe in and that that belief is Im- imprinted you know, as by the time it's seven, it's done, and the child has no defense mechanism because it has no opinion on its own. It is programmed to do what the parents say because nature says that in order to survive, you must be able to follow what you know what your what your elderly tells you. So there's there's so, so there's nature at work, and now you go into the educational system, and the educational system says to you. You need to learn existing information, retain existing information, regurgitate existing information, then you get an A. Don't speak, don't interrupt, don't bring any new ideas, just do what I tell you. 
So we go through this whole system. And then one day somebody like you and me comes and says, well, so tell me what you're really good at. What, what do you want to do? And then people are completely flabbergasted because then they go back to the origin story of which probably includes trauma of some sort, probably financial trauma. There was never enough. You know, dad got the steak. We didn't. We got the potatoes. My brother got the biggest piece. You know, I remember my grandmother giving my brother more chocolate than us. And then she said, well, he's a boy. He deserves more. And so you have these imprinted my stories. Teeth are currently on edge for those in the podcast who can't hear them. <laughs> but but she, she, she felt, you know, in her upbringing, women were not worthy. Men were worthy. This was her only grandchild, son, her grandson. So to her, that was more valuable than the women. And she, whatever experience she ha had in, in World War II, she hated women. And so that was more valuable to her. And I mean, can I at least be okay with that she was honest about it? Okay, fine. Let's find something positive in here. But we have these stories. But now I go, I go in the real world and I go, well, men are more worthy than I am because it's an experience that I have that's been imprinted on me from when I was a little girl. My brother always got more. And then he denies it. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I have a witness, my sister. <laughs> I saw how much chocolate you ate. I will never forget how much chocolate you right, ate. Right, and remember all the acne you had? Guess where that came from, from all the sugar you ate. <laughs> Do you know, I travelled um, with a group called The Hunger Project um, to India in 2019 and met some amazing women leaders over there on a leadership program, and they told a story very similar to your grandma and I, I wrote a blog article about it called milk is for boys and again grandmothers the girls weren't worthy and the boys would get the milk because it would make them big and strong and again teeth on edge it was just one of the most and it's just horrific things but I, it's just stuck in my head the, the milk is for boys story very similar to you know your brother getting the chocolate and yeah, these stories that these, these women grow up believing because that's what they've been told. It's imprinted until someone takes the scales off the eyes and says, wait a second, <laughs> I want some milk too. Not, <laughs> I not, want the chocolate. <laughs> not, so, not so fast, yes. And so now to go back to your original question, how do you, how do you manage something like that? Well, yeah. awareness, and then you yep. need to do the work. Yeah. And you need to look at this and you say, what is true in this? Well, if I look at what my grandmother did and I look at her story, I can see on why, you know, the evil stepmother that wanted to get rid of her, that put her in a farmhouse to learn how to cook and clean. So at least she was worthy when she was 12 years old because her mother died. So she was rid of her and then she went on to marry, you know, her, her father and had more children. My grandmother literally had to be somewhere. Does she hate women for a reason? Probably. Yeah. Right. When her, when her husband came and saved her when she was 18, that she feels men are more worthy. I can see where that story, where that story is originally written. So that's how we have to remind ourselves of is that, the story in, in our past or the story that goes through our head has a lot to do with what we believe in. And then you need to always ask yourself, is this actually true? And do I believe this? And do I want to take this forward? Yeah. Which again, like you said, it's education. It's, it's awareness. Um, I, I read a story one time of a family who, whenever they did lo roast lamb, they would chop the end and the bone off. And eventually the granddaughter's doing it. And her husband says to her one day, why do you cut the lamb every time you do the roast and stick it in the oven? She goes, well, that's how mum taught me to do it. I'll ring her and ask her. Because he's like, I've never seen anyone do that before. My mum didn't do that. So she rings her mum and goes, mum, why do we always cut that bit of the lamb off? She's like, oh, I don't know. That's how my mother taught me to do it. I'll ring mum. And her mother said, my oven wasn't big enough. <laughs> I so remember this, that story. Yeah, these three generations of women cutting up the roast 
for no particular reason. So I love the idea of challenging the story to find out what was behind it and and coming to that understanding. You know, maybe it is just an intergenerational story. Maybe because your grandmother had the evil stepmother and, and such a hideous life, it, it makes sense to them. But how difficult do you find it for us then to challenge those stories? To, I mean, first we've got to think of the story that's holding us back and then go, does that still serve me? How do we make those connections? Because that could that's confronting and it's tricky. Well, so number one, there's a concept that in mindset is called a double binding message. And the double binding message is that consciously, you know, you deserve. So you may be sitting here, you may be driving your car, you're listening to this podcast and you go, yeah, I deserve wealth. I deserve passive income. I deserve financial freedom. I deserve to be wealthy. And then there's a part of you that pops out, says, no, you don't. Remember? Mom always said, you need to be very careful what you invest in. Uh, Daddy always said, get a real job. At least that way you have security. Well, let's laugh on that for one second. Um, because at least you have your, your, you know, your retirement fund and your whatever there is. And so you, you say, I deserve it. And then there's another part of you that goes, no, you don't. No, you don't. And now this double binding message becomes a screaming match inside of your head that you cannot reconcile. Now you're in in a loop, in an open loop that keeps looping and looping and looping. What you want to do now is you want to go and say, instead of fighting it, at the end of the day, does it matter where it comes from? Not really. All that matters is that you know it's there. And then you declare as of today, the story has no more relevance for you. Because so what? Right? So... I guess I didn't get to be fat, thank, thanks to my grandmother, because I didn't eat as much chocolate. <laughs> and I can monitor my chocolate better. intake to this day. <laughs> Maybe I should thank her. There was a good lesson in that. <laughs> there was a good lesson. Don't eat all the chocolate at once. And now I need to think about this as an operating system. So imagine you have an original Mac. And it's very valuable but it has 256 megs and you can't put a floppy disk in it. You can't put a USB port in it. You can't play video games on it. You can't even put any other keyboard or any other mouse than the one that originally came with. So if that's the original operating system that you have, the only way for you to advance outside of that is a new operating system. But that operating system sits underneath. So you have to constantly overwrite this old operating system that says you only have 256 megs. But you go, that's not, that, 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 that's, that's not true. I want to play video games. I want to play movies. I want to watch Netflix. I want to, I want to stream. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so th- that's really the, the, that's the thing is that I always ask myself, is it true? Where is that coming from? Is it even true? I don't know if it's true. It's my memory. But you can't believe everything you think. It's a great, oh, great take out that one. You can't believe everything you think. <laughs> <laughs> that's just perfect. I love it. I love it. That's it. And then if you question your memory, and, and for me that became so clear when my father passed away, So this was, you know, I just flew in from Los Angeles. You know, we knew we had maybe a day, hours with my dad left. And we said, you know, my father passed away that following morning. And we sat there, my brother, my sister, and I in the kitchen. And we had one story. And I'm telling the story and I'm going like, oh, my God, that was so amazing. And then my sister says, that's not at all what happened. And she now tells me her side of the story. I'm like, seriously? And then my brother goes and says, what are you guys talking about? The one that got hit the hardest on that was me. And here's what happened. And then we looked at ourselves and we said, wow, same event. We remember the event. And there is three completely different stories. So which one is true? Probably so all. That's, <laughs> that's why you have to remind yourself that 
what you believe or what you think you remember isn't necessarily what actually happened. It is what you have perceived. That's, a, that, that's what you told yourself it was. But it may not have been that. Yeah. And that's with our biases, our upbringing, our oh. own stuff oh. at the time. So, yeah, there's so, we're so layered, aren't we? It's so complicated. And now add money to this. Now add yeah. money to this. And money belief systems. And now we're really all in trouble. Because... <laughs> Because then, then is mom says, don't, don't waste money. Dad says, I want a dollar more than I want to spend. Grandma says, I only have a certain amount of budget. You always have to stay within your budget. But I buy this expensive cheese. That's the one thing that I give to myself. So now you grow up, you have 16 different messages from 16 different people. What do you believe in? And nobody in there is an entrepreneur who says, I made millions. Go for it. You know, want to be an opera singer? Somebody's got to sing in the opera. May as well be you. Somebody's going to record the next record. May as well be you. Somebody's got to be the next big internet marketing thing. It may as well be you. Somebody has to write these books that people read. I mean, they're bestseller lists. I mean, book have to go on these bestseller lists. That may be your book. But people don't say that. They say, ooh, no. careful. Ooh, probably going to fail. Yeah. Not many make it. Bit Very hard. Few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> unlikely yeah stay in your swim in your zone yep and, and let's face it you're really not a lucky person <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's so many isn't there there's so many and it's the people who yeah do dare to dream and do swim against the tide and and take it that yeah hit the best sellers sing at the opera do what they need to do so your path since selling your business off to mr gates has been to help other people replicate the system that you did to make their money and go gangbusters. Yes. So the idea, the idea is this, that I have, you know, because I've been doing this for a couple of decades, my daughter just had a baby. So this ages me to some extent. <laughs> I just had a grandbaby too. <laughs> it's the, it's, it's, it's it's the best two weeks, two weeks old. Right? <laughs> and, and so, what we bring to the table is the experience and the shortcuts. Because when you do something the first time and it goes haywire, you freak out. When it's gone bad for the 10th, 15th, 20th times, you just go, nah. That's how it is. That's how it is. All right, not that way, fine. Okay, at least I didn't spend too much time and money in it this time. I figured it out pretty early. You'll give yourself a pat on the shoulder. So that's what... That's what I, I, I aim to do is to tell people, look, if you, want to, if you want to follow all this crazy stuff that people are saying, that in four hours a week, you can make millions without ever lifting a finger, that you are entitled at 22 to be happy and know what your life's passion and purpose is and then live in that for the rest of your life as a nomad with passive income, you kind of can do that. <laughs> good, 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 good for you. Rough Find fun, people that tell you that <laughs> and we'll talk in 10 years. But I feel that the service that we provide for people is to say, look, we are walking this fine line between you have hopes and dreams. And our job is to help you to make these hopes and dreams come true without you spending too much money or too much time. But you either invest money or time. So if you don't have money, it's the time you spend that is what's going to cost you, is the lack of success over a period of time. Or you put the money down and then you save yourself time. So that's a conscious decision if you go out that you have to make. That's why people hire consultants like you, Amanda, to help them with understanding the financial aspect of things so they understand the financial consequences and actually know their numbers, which not... Yep, one of my favorite all... expressions, know your numbers. <laughs> Exactly. And what the ROI on something is, what your acquisition costs are and all that good stuff. Or you figure it out on your own. Everything can be figured out. It's just a question is how much time you want to spend on that. So that's what we're here for. And that's what I do. I help people to really understand you can buy whatever you want. But if you think that there's a magic one thing that's going to make everything fall into place, you're going to be perpetually going to conferences and buying stuff because the thing doesn't exist. The thing exists 
when you stop and start designing the model and the strategy, then everything else falls into place, but not before. It's the other way around. Yeah. And, and I love it. I'd love to know the difference in the messages between what you got from your grandmother and now that you're a grandmother, that you'll be teaching your grandbabies. <laughs> Uh, Not eat all the chocolate, I'm guessing. <laughs> tempting. <laughs> Maybe not at two weeks. <laughs> t t temp tempting. <laughs> I, I, I think that I would be lying, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, as you have gone through the same experience, that we also have to give ourselves permission to change the story when the story changes. So now that I have a grandchild and I was a single working mom, obviously up against a lot of external circumstances, now I'm asking myself, who do I want to be today? Do I want to be the crazy grandmother that's you know still running around, constantly flying from A to B to Z? Or do I want to be a stable influence for my grandchild? And what does that look like? you know, let's add a midlife crisis and let's add, you know, sort of all these other things, wanting, you know, loving running a business, helping other people, time, money, and desire. And so within that, that there's a form, there's what the formula is going to be. And the message really I have for your audience is that this is a lifelong quest. You don't figure this out once. There is no there, like ever. There is no there. The minute you think you got there, so I'm not getting already... there. I'm not no. going to get there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Amanda. I'm, I'm, I didn't mean bubble. to. No, sorry. I wasn't quite sure where there was, but I thought I'd get there. <laughs> Too that's funny. what that's what people think. You know, yeah. when I get there, I said, "Where is there?" It's well, the old when I have the money. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy when. When I'll be happy when I have the money. Mm -hmm. When I get the diamond, when I've got this much in the bank, when I've done, yeah, mm -hmm. there's always the next. I'll be happy yeah, when. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same as there. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, Beata. I understand that you have your own podcast as well. Can you tell us where people can listen in if they'd like to know more? Yes, absolutely. So my show is called The Business Growth Architect Show, and it's a show that is specific around things, uh, simple strategies, and ideas, workflows, processes, so that when you listen to the show, you can take like one thing away and try it out. I find that people have a love-hate relationship with systems and strategies. They want to run away from them. Yep. And so I created the show because I want you to really understand what all the different strategies are and then just discriminatorily decide, that's something I can do. That's something I can do. Not so much, but this is something that sounds interesting so that I can get people in the habit of really thinking a little bit more strategic about building their business. Yeah, I'm one of those people who I absolutely love systems and strategies. I just want other people to run them for me. <laughs> that's why we, that, that that's what we that's what we love is to you know. <laughs> we just and, want and them I think to work and that someone else is managing it. <laughs> yeah, and that's really uh, interesting that you mentioned that because that's a, that's an idea that's been uh, percolating. I think this is the opportunity that's arising for me out of all of this, just as a, as an experience share is that I noticed that during COVID, a lot of people have bought a lot of stuff and now they have so much stuff that they can't do it. So now they're looking for people to do stuff. So if your listeners are looking for a business, make it a business that does stuff because that's yeah. the businesses people are looking for right now. Absolutely. No, that's, that's well, if we're here to meet the experts, that's the tip of the day. So <laughs> perfect. Beata, I'll make sure that your a link to your podcast and your socials and that is in the show notes so that people can get in touch if they'd like to learn more. And again, thank you so much for joining me today. I've loved going down the rabbit hole with you and hearing your story. Know. And I'm, <laughs> you know what? I'm really surprised how this season I'll meet the experts. Here I'd, I'd be talking to, you know, fusty fund managers and people experts on shares and bonds and, you know, I think half of the recordings I've done so far have been about resilience and mindset and being mindful and gratitude. So it's it's going in a completely different tangent to what I had thought, but I'm absolutely loving that money is now not just this, you know, hideous taboo subject that, you know, there's shame around it or it's got to be hidden, but people are coming out with, you know, all these fabulous ideas. So I'm, I'm so excited that you're... I'm finding and attracting all these wonderful people who, who believe that. So again, thank you so much, Beata. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda.